In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is February the 10th, 2024, here at the Oratory of the Sorrowful Heart of Mary in New Hampshire. About this Holy Virgin, St. Scholastica, the scripture says, Oh, how beautiful is the chaste generation with glory, for the memory thereof is immortal because it is known both with God and with men. And this Holy Virgin, Saint Scholastica, was the sister to Saint Benedict, and when he had established his monastery on the mountain of Monte Cassino, about 50 miles out of Rome, she also established her convent not far from there, within five miles, and every year, St. Benedict used to visit his sister and visit her, the nuns. And they would pray together and speak of heavenly things. And on this last visit, St. Scholastica, this is told by the dialogues of St. Gregory the Great. <coughs> she must have had a premonition that this was her last visit with her brother. And she begged him to stay a little longer to pray and to discuss and to talk about the, the things of heaven. And St. Benedict said to her, well, I cannot breach the rule. I, I cannot be out all night and I have to get back with the, the brothers to the monastery. So she prayed. She, as Father Albin Butler says here, laying her hands joined upon the table and laid her head upon them with many tears, she begged of Almighty God to answer her prayer that St. Benedict stayed longer. And no sooner had she finished praying than a gigantic storm broke out with lightning, thunder, and downpour of rain and heavy winds. So St. Benedict complained to his sister, saying, God forgive you, sister, what have you done? She answered, I asked you a favor, and you refused it to me. So I asked it of Almighty God, and he gave it to me. So St. Benedict stayed and they continued to talk about the things of heaven and the scriptures and monastic life. And he spent all night, and then he left in the morning back to the monastery with his brothers. Three days later, he saw a dove ascending into heaven, and he understood it was the soul of his sister, St. Scholastica, who had just died. So he understood the hand of God who interceded answering her prayer. So she died about the year 543, and her relics were later taken to France. So St. Saint 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 Scholastica, she shows us the power of prayer, that we should pray with confidence, with humility, and our life has to conform to it. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers because maybe, one, he knows better, and it's not the time to answer. And maybe what we ask is not what is needed for our salvation. Or the timeliness. <clears throat> With God, timeliness is everything. And sometimes he doesn't answer when we want, but he'll answer at a time that he knows is most fitting. Just as parents, when their children ask, well, can we... Can we eat now? Well, the mother or father knows and say, no, it's not the time. You got to do this first and that first. Do your chores first. So there's a time for everything. And in God's wisdom, it's far, far wiser than our little human perceptions. So we should always keep persevering in prayer. And God always answers. And when he seems not to answer, he always answers better than we expected. 
And if he doesn't answer for sure in this life, he will certainly answer in the next by his rewards, by a shortening of purgatory, by the glory of heaven. So we should always persevere in prayer. Let me go through a few quotes from some saints about prayer. We can all profit from this because many souls say God doesn't hear our prayers. This crisis of the church drags on. We have the worst pope in the history of the church on the throne of Peter who mocks tradition and, and exalts the sodomites. This is very offensive to God. And the whole crisis of the church, the dragging out of the crisis, the, the silence and weakness of bishops, traditional bishops as well, it's a heavy cross for all of us. And, and then we have our own crosses of daily life, and families and so forth and so forth so listen to some of these encouraging words from first saint john vianney he talks here about the the sign of the cross how we should love to make the sign of the cross and tomorrow is the feast of our lady of lourdes and when all the people saw saint bernadette imitate our lady making the sign of the cross with such reverence and a certain slowness the, the people were impressed with the reverence, and so was St. Bernadette herself, seeing Our Lady make the sign of the cross with such reverence. Here's what St. John Vianney says, The sign of the cross is the most terrible weapon against the devil. Thus the Church wishes not only that we should have it continually in front of our minds, to recall to us just what our souls are worth, and what they cost Jesus Christ, but also that we should make it at every juncture ourselves, when we go to bed, when we awaken during the night, when we get up, make the sign of the cross, when we begin any action, and above all, when we are tempted. We can say that a Christian who makes the sign of the cross with genuine religious sentiments, that is to say, when when full aware, fully aware of the action which he is performing, he makes all hell tremble. But when we make the sign of the cross, we must make it not by habit, but with respect, with attention, in thinking of what we are doing. In other words, not shooing flies. Ah, oh, dear Lord, with what devout awe we should be filled when we make the sign of the cross upon ourselves and recall that we are pronouncing all that we hold holy and most sacred in our religion. Saint Francis of Assisi, he says, Spiritual joy arises from purity of the heart and perseverance in prayer. St. Louis de Montfort, only he who will receive will find and will enter who perseveres in asking, seeking, and knocking. So the key is always, again, perseverance. St. John Vianney, again, he died in 1859. The more we pray, the more we wish to pray, like a fish which at first swims on the surface of the water and afterwards plunges down and is always going deeper. The soul plunges, dives, and loses itself in the sweetness of conversing with God. So St. John Vianney knew this at a young age when he was plowing the field. He would throw before him a few feet a little wooden statue of Our Lady to keep his mind focused on the glory of God and, and prayer. And as a young soldier, when he was 18, he went to visit a church and was so wrapped in prayer that the rest of the troops marched on. And when he came out, he thought he was just there for five minutes. It turned out he was there for about five hours and they had already marched on. <clears throat> St. Alphonsus Liguri, he who does not give up prayer cannot possibly continue to offend God habitually. Either he will give up prayer or he will stop sinning. And St. Louis de Montfort says the same thing about the rosary. Either we will persevere in the rosary, 
and abandon our habits of sin, or we will abandon the rosary and become more enslaved to habits of sin and lose our soul. But if we persevere in praying the rosary, we will save our soul. That's the power of this, this machine gun, this chainsaw from heaven. Some practical advice on how we should pray. St. Saint Teresa of Avila, she says, Before prayer, endeavor to realize whose presence you are approaching and to whom you are about to speak. We can never fully understand how we ought to behave towards God, before whom the angels tremble. I might add, when you see the Tridentine Mass, even a low Mass as simple as this, and then you see the High Mass or a Pontifical Mass or Solemn High, you see the reverence, the genuflections, the bows, the concentration on the holy action taking place at the altar, the Beretta that's removed when the priest sits at the Sedilla and removes his Beretta at the name of Jesus Christ, or certain verses, and then we kneel at Incarnatus, in, at Incarnatus Est, at the Credo. <clears throat> All these things teach us that profound reverence towards God, which is lost in the New Mass. Complete irreverence, complete abuse, complete abomination before the throne of God, if he's even there at these new masses, probably not because of these invalid ordinations. Someday the church will pronounce on that. Here's St. Jean, Jean Francois de Chantal. She was a devotee under St. Francis de Sales. She says the great method of prayer is to have none. Don't have a method. If in going to prayer one can form in oneself a pure capacity for receiving the Spirit of God, that will suffice for all method. Yes, um, the great Dom de Lat of the Benedictines, he did not like methods in prayer. Some people get really stuck in you got to do it this way, you got to approach prayer that way. And many scholars and even theologians and saints have approaches but God is very free with prayer and Dom de Lot said forget the methods just speak to God simply as a child St. Francis de Sales says stretch forth your hand towards God as an infant towards its father to be led by him So reach your, reach your hand out as little children do when they're walking and they, they want to hold their dad's hand to hold, guide them over some rough terrain. And the father grabs his hand and, and leads the child. That's, so that was how we should be towards God. And with Our Lady grabbing her hand, it's, it's like grabbing the rosary. St. Benedict, this is the brother of St. Scholastica, says, Prayer ought to be short and pure unless it be prolonged by the inspiration of divine grace. So when we speak of the family rosary, 20 minutes a day, what is that? What is that? Nothing. People spend hours watching sports games, movies, video games now. Hours. And they complain often about, oh, we got to pray the rosary, 20 minutes, what's that? Or when they go to Mass, you know, I, I hear long, I hear complaints about long sermons, and I do uh, sympathize with those who have to endure them. But I always say, you know, you would sit in a stadium watching a football game, hockey game, soccer game for hours and hours and hours. But to hear the preaching of the truth, be brave and listen attentively. You can hear things that will save your soul. St. Madeleine Sophie Barat, she died in 1865. She said, let us ask our Lord to work in us and through us. And let us do our utmost to draw him down into our hearts. For he himself has said, without me, you can do nothing. So yes, we got to always be striving to keep God's commandments. If I pray and then spit on God by my actions, I'm mocking him. So we have to really strive to to root out our sins and what and if you don't succeed keep praying 
you will succeed. St. Jean de Chantal again, prayer should be accomplished by, by grace and not by artifice, that is, not by just human endeavor. St. Bernard, God, the creator of all things, is so full of mercy and compassion that whatever may be the grace for which we stretch out our hands, we shall not fail to receive it. St. Augustine, God is more anxious to give us his blessings than we are to receive them. And that's true. Our Lord told this to a holy Benedictine nun as recorded by Abbot Marmion, how he complained that so many souls don't, they don't even ask him. And he wants to give his grace. He wants to give his gifts. He's infinite God. He has infinite gifts. But we just have, he wants us to ask. But many just don't even ask. St. Gregory the Great, God wishes to be asked. He wishes to be forced. He wishes in a certain manner to be overcome by our prayer. In other words, he loves to be bothered by us. Bother him. Bother the saints. Pull the robe of St. Joseph. Pull the robe of the saints. Pull the beautiful dress of the most blessed virgin mary pull like children do to their mom's dress mom can we do this can we all to have that can we have cookies now but pull the dress pull it's bother god he loves that says saint gregory the great saint augustine says he would not urge us to ask unless he were willing to give saint thomas aquinas who died in 1274 for prayer to be effective, our petition should be for benefits worthily to be expected from God. You ask and you receive, not because you ask amiss. St. James 4. St. Saint, Saint Moses, the Ethiopian from the 4th century, says, some ancient monk, God will not hear our prayer unless we acknowledge ourselves to be sinners. We do this when we ponder on our own sins alone and not on those of our neighbor. So yes, it's often good to begin our prayer with an act of contrition. Or you see the Mass begins with a great act of contrition, the confiteor, and to approach God with great humility, like the publican in the temple. St. Augustine, he knows how to live well, who, who knows how to pray well. St. Louis de Montfort, it is not so much the length of a prayer, but the fervor with which it is said, which pleases Almighty God and touches his heart. So you might just make a sigh to God, like St. Scholastica, Scholastica did, a quick sigh of prayer and humility and begging, and God is touched by it. St. Bonaventure, who died in 1274, friend of St. Thomas Aquinas, said when we pray the voice of the heart must be heard more than that proceeding from the mouth so you know what our lord says about lip service saint edmund who died in 870 it is better to say one our father fervently and devoutly than a thousand with no devotion and full of distraction Why are our prayers not heard? Listen to a few of these quotes. St. Augustine, He who faithfully prays to God for the necess necessaries of this life is both mercifully heard and mercifully not heard. For the doctor knows better than the sick man what is good for the disease. So, uh, uh, as I was saying, when God seems deaf, he's not. He just knows the timing is right. St. Augustine also says he ought to be persuaded that what God refuses to our prayer, he gives and grants for our salvation. St. Basil, the founder of the great Basilian monks who died in 379, the reason why sometimes you ask, have asked and not received is because you have asked amiss, either inconsistently or lightly or because you have asked for what was not good for you, or because you have, you have ceased asking. You gave up. 
St. Teresa of Avila says, Never address your words to God while you are thinking of something else. St. Francis, Saint Francis Xavier Cabrini, named after St. Francis Xavier here, One whose soul is in disorder, whose mind is wandering with vain, useless thoughts, cannot pray. To pray we must unite the flesh with its feeling, feelings to the soul with its imagination, memory, and will. In other words, we, sh we must be focused. St. Thomas Aquinas says, Purposely to allow one's mind to wander in prayer is sinful and hinders the prayer from having fruit. So a willful distraction, fully consented, is a, is a venial sin. St. Louis de Montfort, finally, He who fights even the smallest distractions faithfully, when he says even the very smallest prayer, will also be faithful in great things. St. Teresa of Lisieux, I have many distractions, but as soon as I am aware of them, I pray for those people, the thought of whom is diverting my attention. In this way, they reap the benefit of my distractions. So how's that for quick thinking? St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. So you're praying and people come to your mind, people you might have met, conversed with, whatever. Turn it into a prayer for them. It's not a distraction, and especially if they're dead and they come to mind, it's often God allows that, that you pray for them because they're in purgatory and need prayer. St. Teresa of the Child Jesus again, when I am incapable of praying, I want to keep telling him that I love him. It's not difficult, and it keeps the fire going. So some thoughts on prayer and examples and encouraging words of the saints, because in these days people are very tempted to despair because of the whole political scene, economic scene, and the, the whole facade of the global powers, which are nothing but the powers of darkness headed by Satan. So it didn't take much for David to bring down, down Goliath, and we who are small, Trust in God and in Our Lady of Victory. She will step in and crush this paper, paper kingdom of the globalists. She'll blow it right over. So let's keep fighting and prayer, praying for the victory of Catholic tradition in Rome, for a good Pope, finally, for good bishops, for this oratory to fill with generous young men who want to sacrifice their lives for the love of God, the glory of God, and souls, and brothers as well, to be steady in this battle, to renounce this world and give their lives to God in a joyful service, in a manly battle, the greatest battle. Why go to the Marines when they fight for the globalists? Why go to the Navy when they fight for Biden? Why go for all these useless causes and often unjust when they can give their life to the greatest battle ever, which is the glory of God, the spread of Christ's kingship on earth and the salvation of, of souls. And then we pray also that nuns, we need another building here for convents, for to fill it with good girls, virgins consecrated to God, who love and consecrate all their love to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, who will return his love for them, taking care of them, and that they labor for his glory by teaching, by prayer, firstly, contemplation, and also perhaps taking care of some elderly. We'll see what unfolds in God's plans, but pray for the oratory here and the sorrowful heart of Mary that she put her mantle over it. O oh, Mary conceived without sin, Pray for us who have recourse to Thee. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us. Who have recourse to Thee. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to Thee. And for those who do not have recourse to Thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.